that's me. I think that was a couple of months after I was born, according to my mom. Oh, look how cute I am. Oh, and there's me again. I was really into that cake, apparently. That was for Valentine's Day when I was about three. Oh, there I am again with my brother. Oh, we were really into princesses and Teletubbies then. Oh, and there's me again. Okay, I know what you're thinking. What in the world do all these cute pictures have in common with today's topic? Well, besides the fact that they are all, well, me. In most cases, if you don't see me taking pictures of my fabulous scrunch face or doing band stuff, you'll probably see me with a book in my hands. So shout out to all my former bookworm peeps who can barely stand life enough to read a sentence anymore. I feel your pain. E existence is, is, is very hard. Fiction has served to enlighten us, melt our stresses away, and help us think differently for about forever. Literally. There are multiple studies out there that show consuming fiction actually helps us make connections between source material in our own lives. It reduces our stress by about up to 68% according to the University of Sussex, and it deepens your empathy. Okay, um, but what about all the kids out there that were used to reading comic books for most of their childhood? Does that make a difference? I can't say for sure. But from my perspective, understanding visual expressions, facial cues through beautiful artwork may make the story a little bit easier to consume and honestly makes reading a lot more enjoyable. You know, that's why we have picture books. And the way that I see it, since anime is technically a TV adaption to the manga, as long as it gets you to the same type of realization, I say go for it. Of course, you know, if it doesn't take over your entire life having to consume said medium. Remember to take care of yourself, please, like I said in the last video. But these stories, these concepts, these lessons, I feel that I get from anime are so close to my heart. These characters make me just feel some type of way, definitely a lot more reflective on the things that I can take into my life. And that's what this video is about this week. I really wanna talk about some of the life lessons that I have gained from consuming this content, consuming fiction, specifically manga and anime. And I hope that some of these things you can reflect on and potentially learn in your life. Now, I will warn you because I am talking about anime that was trending in the past or specifically it has new episodes right now currently, I may spill a spoiler or two. I do want to make a concerted effort to not give away too much so you all can also enjoy the fulfillment and excitement that I have also gotten from consuming this type of media. So with that being said, from this point on, I am so sorry if you hear something that you do not want to hear. You have been warned. Let's get started. The number one lesson that I have learned is that grit always beats talent. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of the book or seen the lecture about grit by Angela Duckworth. And you know, that's cool if you have or you haven't. But considering that my heroes at the time this book came out were Midoriya from My Hero Academia, Hinata from the volleyball anime Haikyuu, and probably Nagisa from Assassination Classroom. I feel like looking at all of these timelines for these specific characters, like you basically get the same message that you would by reading Angela Duckworth's book. Now I will say that the Grit book has a much more clear and concise way of actually saying why grit beats talent in most cases. Grit being a mixture of passion as well as effort and perseverance and staying in love with your goals being a key factor in how you motivate yourself to get to that success. I think with the characteristics of each of these storylines that I'm talking about, you can allude to these specific things. For example, the juxtaposition between Midoriya's training with All Might versus Bakugo, who thought that he had this like very natural, awesome talent since he was a kid and then finally had that realization that like he really needed to get his stuff together when he finally got to UA. Or how like Hinata finally figured out how to effectively use his like quick freak to distract other opponents while he was playing volleyball while his rival Kageyama was basically like sitting on his hands trying to figure out like why with all of this natural talent, he was really bad at like the compatibility for his serves to his spikers. All these characters that I'm talking about were finally able to get to some type of success because of their willingness to hope 
their willingness to dream and their willingness to put in a lot of effort to get from point A to point B. And to see that at the time when I first was consuming these particular shows, like that really gave me a boost of confidence when I was feeling a little bit sad about my own career aspirations in life. It was right after I had graduated college. I wasn't sure that going into editing with an English degree made sense for me. I really wanted to figure out what prospects that I had going for myself. And I had realized that with the combination of problem solving and being able to physically see that people were being impacted by the work of solving a problem, like programming was an answer for me. Like how Duckworth summarizes, the amount of effort in developing a skill and overall stacking those skills to achieve a certain type of success doesn't mean that somebody necessarily had like the natural skill or the connections or the talents or ease of means to like gain access to that success. Success. And even though sometimes natural talent or connections can be preferred, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a willingness to actually do the hard work when somebody comes up to a block or some type of difficulty, or even a willingness to do some of the mundane tasks to develop that skill even further. So having that grit means that there is more of a willingness to do more of the hard mundane things to get what you want. And that helps you endure through the rougher patches when things seem dire, when things seem a little bit too difficult, and hopefully it'll point you into the direction that you were looking for in terms of your success. Also, I just, I just wanna stop here for a moment and talk about one of my most favorite examples in anime of grit beating talent that is Ichigo freaking Kurosaki. Who would have thought that that kid would come out going toe to toe with a soul reaper captain after three days of trying to master his bankai? Like that's crazy. That is insane. I mean, I guess considering his family lineage, you could have guessed that he might've had a chance, but if you didn't know at the time, like you'd have been like, yeah, this guy's nuts. Also just, mm, Ichigo is gorgeous. I mean, look at that face. like. Just, what are, you, what are you doing? Look at him. I, I don't care. Like, I, I know he's a fictional character, but like Ichigo can get it anytime, any place. His daddy too. Next, I really want to hit home that there isn't an exact science about whether or not your gut is the best thing to follow when you're trying to make a decision. But there is one study that I looked into from Harvard that suggests that rationalized systematic thinking as opposed to intuitive thinking is going to more likely produce a more emphatic accurate result. Now, before we go on, I would like to introduce a question to the audience. Has following your gut or more likely not following your gut led you in the wrong direction? Personally, my gut hasn't necessarily been completely wrong about a certain situation, but I catch myself more times than not actually getting a physical bodily response whenever I am going against my gut and trying to rationalize whatever decision that I'm trying to make in my head. But let's sit on that question for a moment and go back to watching the anime clips. Kisuke Urahara and Bleach, he lured out Aizen using the Hogyoku. L in Death Note swearing on his life that Light Yagami was Kira. And then even Shigaraki Tomura, who was allying himself with like all of these bad bitches from League of Villains. What do all of these men have in common? Not only are they creative little geniuses who I hate to love, they bore their path to success literally every single time because of the rational thought that they put into making their next moves. Literally looking before you leap will solve 90% of our problems. But are we human? Yes. And are we going to do what humans do best by being little shits when things don't go our way? Also, yes. It'd be nice to, you know, live in a more empathetic, spinning blue globe. That would be nice. <laughs> so third for me is remembering that everybody has some type of trauma. I remember in fairy tale when Natsu's dad, Igniel, just basically left him for like 12 plus years. And then literally as soon as he came back and reunited with his son, just he straight up died. Like, that's messed up, bro. Both of Naruto's parents were off and this little boy had to endure all of these 
crazy, awful villagers by himself over circumstances that he literally could not have predicted for himself. Ooh, Ichigo for the longest time thought that it was his fault that his mother died when in fact it was a hollow that was disguising itself as a human child. On top of that, his mother's powers were actually stolen before she could actually defend herself from the hollow that was disguising itself as a human child. That is incredibly messed up. And I'm sure that somewhere in that poor, helpless, misunderstood little head of his, Light Yagami, was probably traumatized by the absence of his father in his life. Since Soichiro was a detective, he was always dealing with like these like big bad murder cases. And I bet you that he was trying to like get his attention by justifying like taking over the world by just randomly telepathically like killing people and creating the new world in his image. Or I just have one question for you, Light. Um, um, where were you during the afternoon of January 6, 2021? That's right. <laughs> he was dead. <laughs> the lesson here that we can learn from these unfortunate circumstances is that it did not define any of these people in any way, form, or fashion. You definitely had those bouts where it was very upsetting and very emotional to have to endure all of this pain for these particular characters. Except for Light, that guy was a fucking asshole. But there were a lot of good things and good memories that these people were able to attribute to their lives to make them feel less like their lives in general were just like hot garbage. So be kinder to people. Um, make sure that you're not just like excusing anybody's feelings or behavior just because of some like toxic positivity. And don't let all of these like awful circumstances make you become like Light Yagami because he really fucking sucked. And thank you to my friend Kurt Keppel for inspiring today's video. One of his particular tweets that I'd seen a couple of years ago definitely highlighted the trauma in my life in which I relate to anime very very hard with. And speaking of sucky things, you can suck, your friends can suck, your family can suck. I mean, there, there are a lot of sucky things that are out there in this world. And in no way, form, or fashion am I trying to say that you should forgive these particularly sucky people, especially if they did something incredibly awful to you. I am so sorry, and you didn't deserve that. However, if there is a lesson or a consolation that you can get from their actions and behavior, I'm hoping that it's this one. In some cases, parents, and other human beings that are involved in your life are acting out because of three things. Shame, guilt, or fear. Especially with having to try and take care of themselves while on top of having sole responsibility of a little human being. We do not come with instruction manuals and that is illegal and that is immoral. Now these feelings of guilt, fear, and shame aren't necessarily good things. However, they are human things. And in the best of cases, if your supposed hurtful, sucky person was trying to be a good human being, they were acting in the way that they knew how with all of the actions and in the circumstances to help take care of you at the time. I've been leaning more into this with my therapist and I think that it finally hit home for me when I began to rationalize the relationship between the Elric brothers and their father Hohenheim after the last time that I had watched Full Metal Alchemist. Now do not get me wrong, uh, Hohenheim was a cold-hearted son of a bitch, but hopefully in the best of circumstances, his intention really was to truly come back to his family when he figured out how to be, you know, more mortal. I hope this next lesson is one of those things that doesn't really need to be said, but like, let's, let's be honest. Own your weird people, please. If these are the people that I look up to as weird as they are, there's no hope for me for ever being like, a normal person. I like fan fiction smut way too much for that. Please give up on being that perfect person that whoever it is in your life wants you to be. It's not gonna happen. Stop torturing yourself. That's a them problem, it's not a you problem. Another question for you, how much of the Japanese anime that you watch, you watch in subtitles? If you said most of them, then you benefit directly from accessibility standards. Think about it for a minute. According to the Web Accessibility Initiative, captions called subtitles in some areas provide content for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Captions are a text version of the speech and non-speech audio information that are needed to understand the context of the content. 
They are synchronized with the audio and usually shown in a media player when they are turned on. And dubbing is equally as effective of an accessibility feature for the blind and low vision communities. In most cases, you wouldn't have proper access to the shows or media that you want to consume for at least months or years until it's translated into your primary language. If we didn't have some type of accessibility standards in the first place. And for some of you, of course, that's, you know, fine and dandy, like good for you. And for some of you, maybe that will give you initiative to actually learn the language in which you want to consume all that media. I know, for instance, I would really love to learn Japanese within the next three years so I can reduce the amount of subtitles that I use when I watch. But if we didn't have the type of accessibility standards that we do today, we wouldn't necessarily be able to connect on a larger scale with any of the media that we consume and effectively enjoy the same types of media as any other people on the different set of scales of ability. We wouldn't have as big of a community and that would kind of suck. I will say that it's quite disappointing to learn that dubbing has its roots in German fascism, in which media was preferred to be consumed by their quote-unquote native tongue. And I would also argue that some dubbing takes away from the meaning and the significance of the dialogue if it is translated improperly. But again, making sure that we all have a level playing field and accessing the enjoyment of a specific type of content that's not in our native language, um, I feel like that this is still a net positive going forward. And in fact, if you want to know more information, I'm going to link to a couple of Vox News articles about the history of dubbing as well as the debate on subtitles as well as dubbing captions how the technology of audio engineers in the film and TV industry these days has gotten a little bit more complicated, as well as the origins of racism and xenophobia in having to have preferences over dubbing and subbing one way or the other. Personally, I think that we need all of these forms of accessibility again, so that everybody can enjoy the different types of content out there, but I know that it's a little bit more complicated of a subject than that. So please do not come after me in the comments. And then finally, if there is any time to enjoy anime soundtracks, I believe that the primary time to do so is when you are picking out your workout playlist. I'm telling you, I got my headphones in, I am moving, I am grooving. I hate working out, but the fairy tale soundtrack has definitely gotten me through some of those rough patches. That new Bleach soundtrack is fire. You cannot tell me that you don't get some type of inspiration seeing all those training sequences with the music in the background, with them like trying to figure out their mistakes and training harder and harder until they're getting everything right. Like, perfect. Uh, the music makes it 100% better. Okay, I'm I'm actually done obsessing now. I hope that this little peek into the world of anime and Japanese content, especially for the newcomers, has given you like a different perspective on the different types of media that people consume and what lessons that you can actually derive from them to include in your life. And also that it is okay to have a balance of consuming different media for your entertainment purposes. And if sitting at the TV watching anime for hours is not your thing. You can always pick up a comic or a manga. Those are normally the adaptions to anime. They always have different themes, different types of stories. I feel like there's a manga for anybody if you really wanted to get invested into it. Or, you know, you can always stick with normal fiction, you know, that's okay too. Just know that it's lit over here, like you're totally missing out. And if you have any other like lessons or things that you've like derived from this particular media, I would love to hear about them in the comments below. But after that, that's all I got. I'll see you next week.